is to lower his hat. His logic is as simple as his style. If I can't run around them, I'll carry them with me. He is the Titanic, the unsinkable. They pick up the drive sustaining first downs. They score the game clinching touchdowns. And most importantly, they form the foundation for championships. Vince Lombardi knew that big backs bring titles. Jim Taylor helped the Packers to five. Don Shula's Dolphins had a perfect season, and Larry Zonka was the perfect fullback. Chuck Noll built a dynasty, but before Franco Harris, the Steelers couldn't win a coin toss. Of the three, Taylor was the smallest, but the most determined. Number 31 put the power in the Packer sweep and raced all the way to the Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio, where he was enshrined as the fourth leading rusher of all time. A few years later, Larry Zonka joined the Dolphins. 6,700 yards later, Miami had won back-to-back -back world titles, and Zonka was the game's seventh leading rusher. But the most productive fullback is Franco Harris, the NFL's all-time third leading rusher. Taylor, Zonka, and Harris. Their longevity made them great, but today, a new big back dominates the game. He was born Earl Christian Campbell in a shack off Country Road 492 in Tyler, Texas. On the third carry of his pro career, he became a star. Pass ready, retreats to throw. Quick out to Campbell, has a blocker in front. At the 30, 35, 40, 45, he's open. 50, 45, 40, 35, 20, 15, 10. Touchdown, Earl Campbell. Pointers lead it six to nothing. Early in a game, Campbell establishes himself as a force. Few defenders can stop him. But as the game wears on, he wears them down and no defender wants to. Pitchback goes to Earl Campbell. Breaks the tackle at the 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. At the 50, he may go. has just scored on an 81-yard run, and the Houston Oilers have just put this one away. In his first three pro seasons, Campbell won three straight rushing titles, a feat duplicated by only one other man, the great Jim Brown. His coach, Bum Phillips, once said, Earl Campbell may not be in a class by himself, but it sure don't take long to call roll. According to O.J. Simpson, when it comes to strength and desire, no running back is his equal. I've always felt to be a true superstar, you have to have exceptional competitive spirit. Earl Campbell may have just a little bit more than the rest. Nobody gets hit more than Earl Campbell, but Earl Campbell just will not give in. I've seen him go one-on-one -on -one confrontations uh, with defensive players that no other running back playing the game today would come out ahead, and Earl will find himself in the end zone. I don't think there is a more competitive player today playing any position than Earl Campbell. defies all physical laws, for rarely are men so massive, so fast. He 
He is such a dominant runner that in the poll of NFL coaches, Campbell was voted the one man they'd most like to have. the greatest runner in the game today, and perhaps the most potent big man ever to run with a football. The same emptiness of Chicago's Soldier Field, he's as inconspicuous as any superstar can be. His name is Walter Payton, and by game time, it's standing room only, for no man in football generates more excitement. People turn out because they know at any given time or any given moment, Peyton's going to, you know, give that electricity, that excitement of what they're there to look for. Electricity. The word describes him nicely. Walter Peyton is the only man in pro football who could have a three-yard loss described as brilliant. No modern-day runner works harder at his craft, and none is more exciting. In an age of egotistical superstars, Peyton is the ultimate team player. A man so genuinely humble, that his teammates nicknamed him Sweetness. Each Sunday, the soft-spoken dynamo asks the good Lord to grant him strength. And each Sunday, the good Lord delivers. The toughness of a Tonka toy and the quickness of a cat all rolled up in the game's most fearless running style. Mine is one that I got from my, my college coach at Jackson State, Coach Hill, and he always taught never die easy, he said die hard. Whenever opposing defensive player is getting ready to tackle you, let him know that he is being hit. And that's why just before I get tackled, I try to explode into the uh, defensive man. And sometimes I break away and sometimes I drive for extra yards. Said one NFL coach, one day God just picked up a chisel and decided to make himself a halfback. The result? an unstoppable combination of talents that every NFL coach would love to have. Walter has two qualities that you don't really have in one running back normally. He has great speed, but not only is that, he has great strength for his size. Not only do you have to plug the hole up, but you gotta plug the hole up twice, you know, because he's gonna run through you, he's gonna run through your tacklers. So when you combine that kind of strength with good balance and great running ability, then you've got to have a premier running back. I don't think any question that Walter Payton's the best in our business today. He'll live to rewrite the record books. And when his career is done, we'll watch all his plays, and together we'll say, it was a pleasure to watch that man run. Walter Payton, the most exciting running back in pro football today.
wonderful Walter Payton. Truly one of the best ever. Each Sunday, a new series of ordeals awaits the running back. For an instant, he blocks out all sound. He stares into the eyes of his pursuers, and something of himself is revealed. He realizes the next snap of the ball could be his last. 34, set, left, 315, split left, 315, the average length of a runner's career is a little more than four years. His is a world of tape, whirlpools, disabled lists, and doubt. In order for a runner to excel, he must summon up all that is within him. Such a man once played for the Chicago Bears. When Gail Sayers suited up, he played every game like it would be his last. And as a rookie in 1965, Sayers offered a challenge to defenses and a promise to his team. Give me 18 inches of daylight. That's all I need. Sayers was a born runner, the kind that comes along once in a generation. Nicknamed the Kansas Comet, he came to the pros at a time when the AFL and the NFL were embroiled in bidding wars over the best college talent. The father of football, Papa Bear George Hallis, was not about to let Sayers get away. We uh, did draft Gale and Lamar. Hunt also drafted him. Well, I knew Lamar had something like five or six hundred million dollars, and I was concerned whether he'd use that dough to get, help get Gale Series. I was very much concerned about it. Then I saw a game film of Gale in action, and I never saw such moves in my life. And I made up my mind right then and there. Lamar Hunt and all his dough won't mean a thing. I'm going to get Gale Sayers. Those who admired Sayers realized his style, while beautiful, was deadly. Watching him run was like watching a deer run through a minefield. Ultimately, the inevitable happened. A wicked tackle shredded his left knee. Sayers retired at 28 after playing in only 68 games. Still, he was the youngest player ever to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Gail Sayers, magic in motion. Teammates admired and respected him. If you wish to see perfection, you had best get a hold of a film of Gail Sayers. Sayers was indeed magic in motion. He wrote his own rules, then he broke them. He would slip through a hole, then suddenly cut back. A master of improvisation, the possessor of blazing speed.
Twice he won the NFL rushing title. Once for a Chicago team that lost 13 of its 14 games. Number 40 was a number with wings. A Colt lineman once swore that he saw Sayre split in two to avoid a tackle. Another said that as Sayre flew past him, he thought he saw wings sprout from his back. Finally, a shocked Ram defensive back stated that while chasing him, he saw eyes peer out through the back of Sayre's helmet. No other running back could be described in such extraordinary fashion. But no other running back was capable of the performance that Gail Sayers turned in on November 25th, 1965. A storm blew off the lake. The turf was soaked, but Sayers was shot. Scoring five touchdowns, Sayers was taken out, but the fans wanted him to go for another. Papa Bear Hallis put him back in to return a punt, and history was made. After Sayers' sixth touchdown game, Hallis said, that was the greatest football exhibition I had ever seen by one man. The Kansas Comet, to be sure his like will never be seen again. Long ago, football was a game for heroes. Grizzled legends who played until hell froze over. Then, they played on the ice. By the 70s, however, pro football had grown so large that it dwarfed the men who played. The new game needed a new hero. That hero came forth in Frigid Buffalo. His mother named him Orentho. The press called him O.J., but he became known to millions as the Juice. Like the legends, he played on the ice. Like a superstar, he set records on them. had it all. The speed, the size, the moves. But before his rise to superstardom, there were three very long and bitter seasons. My early years in Buffalo were, I guess, frustrating is the best word to put it, because I came out of college, I realized that they were expecting a lot of me. Uh, and I was prepared to give it, you know. I, I wanted, you know, I wanted the ball. Simpson rarely got the ball, and when he did, he didn't carry it very far. The problem was not O.J.'s. His offensive line was poor. One coach foolishly tried to make him a wide receiver. Buffalo and the Bills became a special kind of hell. Another Heisman Trophy flop. They all muttered. But in reality, O.J. was a rocket poised on the path. All he needed was a man to come in and press the button. Well, the turning point in my career was obviously uh, when Lou Saban came to Buffalo. Lou had always been a coach who was in favor of the run. More important, Lou brought some stability to the organization because uh, he featured me. You know, he made no bones about it when he came in, and I led the league in rushing. Saban gave Simpson the ball and five solid blockers. 
O.J. gave the world one hell of a running back. runs were stunning in their beauty, ballet-like in their grace. O.J. was a symphony on the run. made holes where there weren't any and created daylight out of tangled jerseys. For 11 years, he was a marked man, but an entire defense was more likely to wane and lose its concentration before the juice. Every Sunday there came voices proclaiming that on this day the great O.J. would be stopped. And we figured out scientifically without any prejudice who's going to win the ball game. The Steelers are going to win because they're hungry. They didn't have no breakfast today. They've been waiting for the juice! <laughs> the laughter would soon fade away. For once again it was time for the juice to turn it off. Simpson rushed for 200 yards against the world champion Steelers, and he would break the 200-yard mark a record five more times. Before O.J., a 100-yard game was the standard. The Juice did that by halftime. Before O.J., the 1,000-yard season was the standard. In 1973, the Juice had a thousand by mid-season, and everyone wondered, could he gain 2,000? December 16, 1973, Shea Stadium. In that final game, O.J. needed 197 yards to reach 2,000. Like the legends of old, He'd have to do it on hell frozen over. Those who were there will never forget the sight of him slipping and crawling over his muddied blockers, edging ever closer to that magic number. And now it's for the 2,000, boys. not quite over uh, and I went into the locker room and they still had two or three minutes to play and I was the only guy in that locker room and uh, I've never felt like that I, ca I can't recall feeling like that any other time in professional football he left the Trojan horse and the scarlet pom-poms of USC behind over 11,000 yards and four rushing titles later O.J. Simpson was the second leading Russia of all time. Indeed, he was an old-style hero for the modern game. Hey. Go to bed. Now! Are you sure your drinking isn't hurting anyone? Something the rose does it with power. 
sweetness with power and speed. The Kansas Comet had incredible moves. The juice never once lost a lead. But only one man had it all. Jimmy Brown was, without a doubt, the greatest football player ever put on a uniform. I mean, he could just do everything with it. And uh, uh, when you talk about tough, he was just tough because he was such a great talent that he could, he could run with that football. He had great balance, he had great speed, and he had great size. At 235 pounds, he could run 100 yards in under 10 seconds as fast as any halfback. And that's what made him so tough, because you had to set your defense to stop Jimmy Brown. And if you didn't stop him, you lost the game. It was that simple. But you're not going to stop him forever. When he made up his mind to do it, he was going to do it. You couldn't knock him off his feet. Brown was not a beautiful runner. He was a power runner. But in the end, his power was beautiful to watch. His achievements loom larger, considering that he ran against defenses working almost exclusively to stop him. Each week, Brown was the bullseye in an 11-man target shoot, a marked man. And yet, in nine professional seasons, he never missed a game. You know, you would go out there and, and with 11 guys geared to stop Jim Brown, that's, that's pretty tough for him. You know, you're just almost ignoring everybody else because a lot of times it takes five or six guys to get him down. Dick Nolan, who was our defensive safety little guy, Nolan, we used to call him Sticks. He, he didn't weigh 180 pounds. He came up and really hit Jim Brown head on and got him. It was some shot. <laughs> and I came over and I picked Nolan up <laughs> and I said, Hey, Dick, I'm sorry I didn't get there in time, you know, I, you know, but great tackle. You really got him, you know, and he says, great tackle. Hell, he says, I couldn't get out of his way. I once thought Superman wore an S on his jersey and hung around with Lois Lane, said one opposing coach. Now I know he wears number 32 and plays football in Cleveland. He was one great player, and when we drafted him, I, I thought he was going to be a great back. It turns out that, for my money, he's the greatest running back of all time. He recognized my talent, recognized my speed and quickness, and after one exhibition game, he decided I was his uh, fullback. He told me that, and he must have knew a little bit about me because that was what really inspired me. All he had to do was tell me that I was his man, and I would then do the rest of the work. The rest of the work was considerable. And it's all well documented in the NFL record book. In less than a decade, Jim Brown rushed for more yards, recorded more 100-yard games, and scored more touchdowns than any man in history. He won the NFL rushing title an incredible eight times in nine seasons. And among the great defensive players of his era, he had nothing but admirers. I don't think that anybody really too often gets a good, clean shot at Jimmy Brown. And when you do, you just give it a little bit of extra, as hard as you can, maybe thinking, I'm just like to hit him hard enough, maybe I could put him out of the game or something. By that time, you just feel, well, I might as well help him up, but it's not too often that you do it. When you gang tackled him, when you gave him those extracurriculars, unlike some of the ball players that get a frothing from the mouth and obscene language, you dirty this and that, I'll get you, and then you this and you that, Jimmy would get up off the ground slowly, look at you and kind of say, hi, go back to that huddle slowly, and he just kept coming. He had a sight for that goal line, 
when he was within a yard or two away from it. He could see it, and brother, he made every effort. It was just like an elephant or a bull just giving that extra little bit of something. And you talk about dragging people. I think he dragged more people from the two-yard line in than any person I ever saw in my life. You get a good angle on Jimmy, it stop, and then suddenly go against the grain, which is unique and unusual for a man that size. And away he goes. Brown's brilliance on the field was in sharp contrast to his withdrawn, sometimes moody personality. His critics said that he wouldn't have done nearly as well against today's stronger defenses. Brown answered his critics on game day. I played nine seasons, I never missed a game. And I never laid out on the football field. Guys now accept the fact that they can be hurt slightly, run off the field, get themselves together, and come back. I might not have the greatest ability of everybody, but the one thing that stands is that when it was time to play, I was there. Who was the best quarterback of all time? The best receiver? The best team? Who can really say? But when it comes to running backs, one man stands alone above the rest. Jim Brown. Stampede ahead like angry bulls. They dance out of danger's way. Their speed lets them leave the others behind. Their grace is the game's ballet. Sometimes they take on entire teams in quest of that one final yard. Other times, escape is an impossible task. It's then that they land and see stars. degrees from the school of hard knocks, for each down exacts its toll. But greatness belongs to those stout-hearted few who have never lost sight of their goal. They come from towns all over this land, where they left all the others behind. They transcend the game. To them goes the fame. The very, very best. They led New York to six conference titles and one NFL championship. And in doing so, they gave a new definition to that formerly obscure word, defense. It is the most tribal and universal of football fan rituals. Yet there are those among NFL historians who believe that this battle cry was first chanted in the mid-1950s, originating from the rafters of New York's Yankee Stadium. In a game that climaxed the NFL's first season of nationally televised broadcasts, Millions of home viewers heard the deafening roar and watched a very responsive giant defense. The Giants' crushing championship win over the Chicago Bears was the beginning of an eight-year era that saw a whole new type of slugging power come to the fabled house that Ruth built. 
It began when head coach Jim Lee Howell added a young Tom Landry to his already talented staff of assistants. Landry's innovative mind melded together with men like Jimmy Patton, Andy Robostelli, Jim Katkavich, Rosie Greer, and Dick Mojaleski to produce the NFL's most dominant and difficult to detect defense of its day. first defensive team that all of a sudden started putting the good athletes over on defense. Up to that time, the better athletes, especially linemen, uh, running backs, were on the, on the offensive side. And all of a sudden, they started putting a little better athlete. Uh, then also, they went and started studying offensive formations and what teams were doing, which is what Tom does. It was a first. Landry and that group had put together a defense that uh, had certain uh, refinements to it that the offenses hadn't caught on to yet. One of those refinements was the creation of the 4-3 defense, designed to take advantage of the instinctive skills of middle linebacker Sam Huff. In this defense, the job of the four down linemen was to keep Huff free of potential blockers, leaving him free to act as a rover, whose task was to be in the vicinity of the football. This scheme was one of a number of ploys the Giants successfully used to neutralize their main nemesis, number 32, Jimmy Brown. Sam was basically the quarterback of that defense, and he had the flair to understand that he was in New York, so he became an instant celebrity by attaching himself to my legs quite often. We hit him whether he had the ball or not, and we knew that we had to stop Brown because their offense was built around him. Why shouldn't you? you know, the man averaged 5.2 yards a carry lifetime. Uh, we had to stop Jim Brown to beat the Cleveland Browns, and we were able to do it because of, of the defense we had in those days. We played a, what we call the coordinated defense. We were able to shut down the gaps for him where he couldn't find the gap to get through, and, and we were successful, probably better than anybody. No one stops him completely, obviously. He's too great a back to have that happen, but we slowed him down enough so that we ended up in the late 50s of being in a lot of championship games than Cleveland was. In addition to capably handling their rivals from Cleveland, the Giants' defense also became highly proficient at putting points on the board. This mixture of creative stratagems and game day opportunism endeared this unit to their fans. Along with the public praise and adulation, media attention was for the first time devoted to a defense. Giant defenders were not portrayed as mindless brutes but rather as a team-oriented group of friendly, thoughtful, and articulate men. This high-gloss treatment, however, did not wear well with all of their teammates. There was a lot of animosity, a lot of jealousy between the offensive unit and the defensive unit, because the defense really came into prominence for the first time, I guess, in the history of pro football. In those days, they didn't even introduce the defensive ball players. It was only the offensive ball players that were introduced before the game. And it was always, you know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, number 16 from Southern California, Frank Gifford. In those days, when uh, Sam Huff was maybe making uh, eight or nine thousand and fighting Wellington Mara to make it ten, uh, I might have been making eighteen or twenty. That didn't sit too well with the likes of a Sam Huff. There was a little animosity about that because we were doing on defense, we were doing an awful lot of playing, and we were holding teams, you know, to to six points and to three points, and we went three games. I remember, and never scored a touchdown offensively, and we won two of them. At one period, you know, when we'd come off the field, uh, Sam might say, see if you can hold them, we'll try and score on defense the next time around. Despite the presence of any ill will, those who came into contact with this unit grudgingly agreed that they were pioneers in the effort to bring teamwork and intellect to defense the most intelligent def defensive club in football, New York Giants. Every man knew his position, knew what he was supposed to do, knew where he was supposed to help out. They played together probably as well as any team I've ever coached. They had just a sense of feel, you know, between each other. 
It was a good football team. It was it was good talent, but it wasn't really any better than than some of the teams in those days. But their ability to play together and believe in each other, the way they believed in each other, was tremendous. In 1960, Tom Landry moved on to coach the Dallas Cowboys, but the men he left behind went on to play in three more NFL championships. Although the Giants came up short in each of them, their defense performed bravely, particularly in the bitter defensive struggles against Green Bay in 1962 and Chicago in 1963. Ironically, a dynasty both began and ended with a title game against the Bears. But while one era was passing on, a new one was dawning. Various retirements and trades closed this chapter of defensive brilliance. But a symbolic seed was transplanted with Rosie Greer's transfer to the Rams, where he helped give celebrity status to Los Angeles' suddenly famous fearsome foursome. It was a start of a color league in those days, and the average salary uh, was about $7,500 a year. Everyone knew everybody else, and rivalries were fought fiercely and frequently. And such an environment fostered great teams and exciting players. Some fun-loving guys, others not very nice at all. But this uh, spicy combination made up a period in sports history that is regarded as the golden age of pro football. The fabulous 50s, the Eisenhower years. A period when people took life and each other a little less seriously. A decade where the vision of America was tinted with optimism. Nowhere was this image clearer than in pro football. It was heroic, romantic, and nostalgic. The purest form of sport. Pro football became the new national obsession and burst into full flower in the 50s. For nostalgia buffs, the 50s meant fire wagon football, a merry-go-round of big plays, a circus of carefree and colorful performers. It was filled with magic moments and magical plays. One half of pro football's all-time team played in this decade. Pro football in the 50s was not stylized or synchronized, but a wild game. A highlight film with all the penalties and mistakes left in. At the top, pro football bubbled like soda pop, effervescent and sweet. But beneath the surface, the game had a harsh, bitter taste. It was a rough, violent, often brutal sport. And you get into that sort of a cannibalistic feeling. All you want to do is go out there and, like I say, you just want to kill somebody. I want to get him, I'm going to kill him. Not mean you are, you're going to put him in the ground after, but you just want to kill a guy, boy. You, you, you actually froth from the mouth and you're going to really put it to him. In the 50s, the meek did not inherit this turf. There were bitter rivalries between teams and fierce grudges between players. One that festered for years concerned the Rams' Deacon Dan Towler and the Colts' Art Donovan. I said, let's get Deacon Dan. Now was our time. He said, fine. So here comes the, the Rams out of huddle. Van Bakken was a quarterback. He hands fake hand off to Deacon Dan. He comes into the line. They pitch the ball out to a halfback. And Finn and I got Deacon Dan down on the ground. We're really going at him. So the official grabs us. He says, if you guys do that again, it's going to cost you 100 bucks. I'm going to throw you out of the game. We didn't know that Deacon Dan, he ran off the field. And they put the other fullback in named Tank Younger. And they both look alike. Uh, they were six foot three, 240 pounds. They're both black. So unless you knew the number, you didn't know who they were. Same play again. We got him down on the ground. Now, I got his nose. And I'm trying to pull his nose off his face and finish, finish banging on the back of the neck. So all of a sudden, from underneath the park comes, hey, he says, leave me go. He says, this ain't the deke. It's the tank. We had the wrong guy. Players like Art Donovan could find something funny in a broken leg. They were undeniably violent, certifiably tough. 
I lost six teeth on one play when I blocked a punt. He kicked me in the teeth and uh, knocked all my teeth out. And I vividly remember that because I was looking on the ground for my teeth. And when I'm, and everyone was yelling, get in the huddle, Bob. You know, it wasn't get off the field, Bob. You know, get in the huddle. We, we, we don't want to call a timeout. Number 79, Bob St. Clair of the 49ers had a caveman aura, but he was no brainless brute. At six foot nine, 270 pounds, he was a massive blocking machine. St. Clair credited his great strength to eating raw meat, an eccentricity which earned him the nickname, the geek. We used to go out and shoot doves, and it was all illegal, you know, in the season and so forth. And uh, I would, would take the, the doves, and uh, I remember one day, I, mean, I had about 12, uh, you know, maybe more than that, uh, 12, 15 doves. And we were plucking them and cleaning them, and I would take the heart, you know, and I was making a little pile of dove hearts over here in the corner. And then this, this uh, kid from Nebraska came Omaha and came over and said, uh, what are you doing with that pile of hearts? And I said, why, well, I'm going to eat them. That's why I put them over there. And he said, what are you going to have, make some kind of a sauce? I said, sauce? No, 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 these are real good this way here. You see these? And I, I put two in my mouth and was chewing on them and looking at them. And I thought he, was, he turned three different colors. I thought he was going to faint right there. He ran out of there. I'm sure that he would call back to his girlfriend or his wife or his mother or something in, in Omaha and say, there are cannibals out here. The 1950s produced the most outlandish cast of characters in pro football history. A witch's brew of monsters, mavericks, and magicians. The most colorful team in the league was the Detroit Lions, a riotous bunch of revelers who loved wine, women, and song. Their party shaper was quarterback Bobby Lay. One time we passed him at halftime, coming out for the second half in Baltimore. I said, Bobby, how you doing? He breathed on me. I said, Jesus, is that from last night? He said, I had a couple at halftime. So, you know, he was a character, but a great football player, tough guy. This blonde, slightly pudgy Texan played football and lived life in flamboyant style. In a city of working men, number 22 was a workmanlike quarterback who appeared to do nothing right except win. I did do some things that uh, I do regret now. Uh, I did. Uh, I, as I always said, I went in the front door. I didn't sneak in the back door. It hurt my family some. That's the only thing. The publicity. Everybody knew me in Detroit, and I couldn't go anywhere without some conversation. A teammate once said, when Bobby said block, you blocked. When he said drink, you drank. Lane and the Lions typified a sense of adventure, something that transcends statistics a flare that endures in the memory. Hit him, he didn't care. Play without a face mask. And then you really went after him. Three of us hit him at one time, and they all hollered, watch out, Bobby, here they come. And when he got him back in the offensive huddle, he kicked two of them. He kicked Creekman right in the legs. He was so mad at Creekman for missing Marchetti, he, he kicked him right in the shins. Creekman stood there and took it. Bobby was hot-headed and explosive. He played full tilt every moment and expected his teammates to do the same. Under his whip, the Lions won four Western Conference titles, two NFL championships, and became more important to Detroit than General Motors. While the Lions were consistently of championship caliber, other teams also shaped the history of the 50s. The Los Angeles Rams dominated the early years with a glamorous team that possessed more skilled players than any team of the decade. The Rams rang up points like a pinball machine, and the results of their games read like old-time basketball scores. In 1956, George Hallis's Chicago Bears were primed to win a title with their bruising style of play. 
but 1956 belonged to number 42 quarterback Charlie Connolly, who passed the New York Giants to an NFL championship. All across the 50s stretched the shadow of the most dominant team, the Cleveland Browns. In 10 years, the dynasty created by Paul Brown captured seven Eastern Conference crowns and three NFL championships. While the Browns were a model of excellence, a history of failure had marked the Baltimore Colts. The 50s Colts were victims of bad breeding, sired by the sad sack Colts of the late 40s and the dreadful Dallas Texans of 1952. These Colts were a bad seed. They were a collection of oddballs, a team with little character, but many characters. Don Colo, Sister Overna, Y.A. Till, and myself, we were roommates. So we had a big shower in this big bathroom, and we locked the shower stall door, and we filled up the shower all the way up to maybe about six foot. And we went over the top from the glass, and we're in the four of us are in there. We're all, you know, bear, uh, swimming around, having a good time. And somebody hit the latch, and the damn door opens up, and maybe 100 gallons of water goes all over our floor and down the next apartment house, and the ceiling caved in. And you know how to pay for it. Tittle, we didn't have any money. And he was the only guy making any money, and from that day, he would never speak to us, really. He was tied in a clan with Lodgejaw. Head coach Weeb Eubank rebuilt this laughing stock of a team by drafting sure shots or taking chances on obscure college players. Tackling fullback Alan Amici, number 35, proved harder than knocking a tank off its tracks. And there was no defense against the acrobatics of Raymond Barrett. The Pony Express began to roll in earnest when a racehorse named Lenny Moore became their number one draft choice. Wild number 24 added a new dimension to the offense. It was another eager rookie that made the dramatic difference. Johnny Unitas transformed himself from a $6 a day sandlot player into an NFL quarterback and transformed the Colts from chumps into champions. We had a football team that, you know, laughed together, played together, uh, lived together, liked each other. It was a rare combination of personalities and talents, and uh, I think the Colt team in those years was the best place in the world to be. Great ownership, great leadership, and great players. Baltimore won an NFL championship in 1958, and again in 1959, when they defeated the New York Giants. This marvelous team, which included seven Hall of Fame members, crushed the Giants 31 to 16 to close out the decade. By the turn of the decade, pro football became part of the American culture, and the fabulous 50s will be remembered fondly for those monsters, mavericks, and magicians who played their sport with abandon, with delight, and with a touch of class. He's really angry. I don't think this one is clowning at all. It's a bad and an ugly scene, and it's unfortunate, I think, that it's happened in the middle of showing a classic fight between two extraordinary athletes. I think that Ali is probably clowning, but there is no question in my mind that Joe Frazier is not clowning. That was not controversy for the sake of controversy. There was no agitation, although some people in print who were not in that studio had the audacity to call it a stage promotion. Monday Night Football put Howard Cosell in the middle of another controversy. On September 21st, 1970, it all began. I'm Howard Cosell, and welcome to ABC's Monday Night Primetime National Football League television series. As a primetime series, Monday Night Football had to entertain. So along with the controversial Cosell, ABC hired Dandy Don Meredith and one year later, Frank Gifford. I respect 
effect on Meredith. I said earlier the task is to get a fix on sports. Meredith has a fix on life. Hibbert's been my friend for 30 years. If I needed help, I wouldn't hesitate to go to Frank Hibbert, and I would get it. The threesome's emphasis on showbiz brought criticism from football purists, but the public loved it, and players such as O.J. Simpson got themselves up for Monday night games. Meanwhile, the Cosell, Meredith, and Gifford team blended beautifully. On this Joe Washington run, they were at their very best. And it's Joe Washington. This. And it's Joe Washington. He's on his feet. He has great speed. And it's Joe Washington. Oh, oh, how could it happen? Oh, what a football it. game this turned out to be. Opinion of the broadcast team was not always positive, however. Cosell was usually the target of dissenters. At the stadium, people were just as expressive. There is a vivid picturization of the excitement attendant <laughs> <laughs> upon this game. The number one in the nation. South East three eight. NFL Today is sponsored by Isuzu Cars and Trucks, offering both gasoline performance and diesel reliability. True Value Hardware Stores. True Value, more than just a name, it's our way of doing business. And by Federal Express, when you have a package that absolutely positively has to be there overnight, Federal Express. And now, Brent Musburger. God, I got horses. Good afternoon. Oh, hello, everybody. Fourth. One play among thousands in a decade that had it all. Absolutely unbelievable. Holy moly. This is the story of 10 years of pro football. It's a story of champions. Teams that set the standard for all the rest. And above all, it's a story about men, great men, whose runs set the records, whose teams won the titles, and whose magic made the memories, the memories that will forever be a part of the Super Seven. As the decade began, a protest-weary nation said goodbye to the turmoil of the 60s. A spirited new era was arriving. It was a self-indulgent era, preoccupied with personal appearance and artistic self-expression. Pro football was a reflection of the times. It was an age of superheroes, where one mild-mannered pass catcher named William Johnson could doff his disguise and become Billy White Shoes. Above all, it was an age of innovation. Early in the decade, Kansas City Chief wide receiver Elmo Wright unveiled a brand new form of self-adulation. Before long, everybody was punctuating scoring plays with their own stylized steps. 
70s would be without Vince Lombardi. Lombardi's legendary Packer teams dominated the 60s, translating Lombardi's fundamental designs into five world championships. death and the collapse of the Packer dynasty created a power vacuum in pro football that wasn't filled until 1972. Then along came Don Shula and the Miami Dolphins. The Dolphins achieved greatness because Shula's emphasis on fundamentals made them into a team strikingly similar to Lombardi's Packers. His line's execution on the power sweep would have made Lombardi smile. His ball control back Larry Zonka was cut from the same sturdy stock as Green Bay's Jim Taylor. so-called no-name defense, like the Packers, didn't brutalize opponents. It simply didn't let them score. And finally, his quarterback, like Green Bay's Bart Starr, was a model of efficiency. Through four weeks of the 72 season, the Dolphins were undefeated. Then, Shula lost quarterback Bob Greasy to a fractured ankle. But just as Lombardi had Zeke Brakowski in reserve, so did Shula have backup quarterback Earl Moore. The 72 Dolphins won 16 straight games and advanced to Super Bowl VII. There, only the Washington Redskins stood between them and the NFL's first perfect season. Washington Redskins 14 to 7, the first of two consecutive Super Bowl wins for Don Shula. The Miami Dolphins, the new Green Bay Packers.
Now, Sunoco's Match and Win game has new prizes, more chances to win. Scratch two matching diamonds and win a Chevy Cavalier, an Air Canada Hawaiian vacation for two, or thousands of other prizes. Collect all four color sections of the same picture to win even more prizes, including the grand prize of $25,000. At Sunoco. Students with a Commodore VIC-20 at home have a distinct advantage because the Commodore VIC-20 turns your TV into the sister computer of the Commodore PET found in most schools. So even when they play VIC-20 games, they learn concepts that can lead to greater things. They can do their homework, write their own programs, and the computer time they get at home gives them a real advantage at school. That's the Commodore VIC-20 advantage. Shouldn't your child have it? I like it. If you really like it, I really like it. We can help you get it. We're GMAC. We like it. We're GMAC financing. When it's time for that new family car, GMAC can help you get it. With financing to fit your budget. It's available right here at your GM dealer. If you really want it, we can help you get it. We're GMAC financing. Behind a very special pair of Levi's jeans, you'll find a very special symbol, a red tab. The color of a blue jean legend. A legend of fit, comfort, and style. Of durability not just promised, but proved. It's a legend that hasn't changed in 132 years, cast in these rivets, pockets, and seams. Be part of the legend. Ask for Levi's red tab. The jeans are blue. The legend is red. There are a lot of good reasons you should be watching Global News. Some of them are Truman, Tennant, Garvey, Dobb, Burgess, Ansco, McAdory, Richard, Small, Banning, Brahma, Wilson, Adams, Wolf, Pockmersky, Jackson, McCowan, Burke, Darby, Newman, Bird. That's a news team that cares. Truman's team. And it all comes together for Global News just when you need it most. On Global News, tonight at 11. Hash marks, a series of lines between which every offensive play begins. Before the 72 season, they were spaced 40 feet apart. In 72, the rules makers narrowed the distance to 18 and a half feet. Their intention was to put more offense into the game. Their logic was that by giving wide receivers more room to operate, they would encourage the forward pass. Instead, they usher in the year of the runner. Ball control was in, and a halfback with elusiveness was essential to success. fullbacks who could string out pursuit, then escape down the wider field. The 1972 season produced more thousand-yard rushes and more total rushing yards than any season before. A vintage year for pro football's ball carrier. The decade as a whole produced some of the greatest ball carriers of all time, among whom three stood above the rest. One was Chicago's Walter Payton. The second was Houston's Earl Campbell. The third was Buffalo's O.J. Simpson. Among the three of them, 
there wasn't a single ounce of quit. decade, O.J. Simpson's accomplishments were the most sensational. The Southern California sprinter had 5,000-yard seasons, 36 100-yard games, and became only the second man in history to rush for 10,000 yards in a career. And now it's for the 2,000, boys. And on a snowy day in 1973, he became the only man ever to rush for 2,000 yards in a single season. O.J. running left. There it is. He did it. He did it. Yeah. I just wonder if the three of us at this moment fully realize what it has been our great privilege to watch O.J. Simpson run for 2,000 yards in one season. O.J. Simpson, the player of the decade. The Pittsburgh Steelers, the team of the decade, a team sustained by its defense. During the 70s, there was no tougher assignment in the sport than a close encounter with a steel curtain. Their founding in 1933, Steeler teams were always hard hitting. But four decades of issuing headaches had not produced a single NFL championship. Then the Steelers hired Chuck Knoll. Knoll's first pick in the 69 college draft was Mean Joe Green, a man with no fear. year, Noel drafted a small college quarterback named Bradshaw. For six years, Noel used the draft like an artist, with each stroke adding new dimensions to his masterpiece. And by 1974, Mona Lisa was hungry for a title. underdogs in the 74 AFC title game. They left Oakland with a conference championship. They arrived in New Orleans for Super Bowl IX like a college team at homecoming. The Minnesota Vikings didn't stand a chance. Super Bowl X, 
they were in a class all by themselves. Pittsburgh Steelers, a young dynasty created through the draft, a team that would rewrite the record books before the decade was over. Life goes on, and so can Archie. We got a little confused here about this music there. Huh? What was he getting on? He was talking about a rock group called Who? I don't know. The man never got to that. You're on your way to comedy down at Archie Bunker's place. Global's got it, Sundays at 8. Budweiser salutes the people who keep Canada on the move. Our best for you. There's no one else who does it quite the way you do. This Bud's for you if you like your beer with a clean, crisp taste. The Beechwood Age Budweiser taste and smoothness you'll find in no other beer brewed in Ontario. For all you do, this Bud's for you. This is Canada's Navy at work. It's the vital work of peacetime protection and of wartime raids. Work that requires skill and precision under the most exacting conditions. And it takes a special kind of person to do it. If you think you've got it, welcome aboard. There's no life like it. No, there's no life like it. No, there's no life like it. Call us collect about a career in the Canadian Forces Navy. We're in the yellow pages under recruiting. Thousands of years, one drink has been helping build up people while tearing down thirst. One drink, delicious, fresh as snow, satisfying, and irreplaceable. The Information Center. May I help you? The Life and Health Insurance Information Center is a public service that's really helpful right now. Good information about life and health insurance is more important than ever, what with new tax laws and inflation, and many companies bringing out new insurance